Hey there, Little Warriors. I'm Steve, and welcome back to Little Wars TV. Now, these days, thanks to the novel coronavirus and the governor of Pennsylvania, our club hasn't been able to get together to do any in-person gaming for a few weeks now. We've tried some virtual options like Tabletop Simulator and Vassal, but there's still plenty of time left over. One of the ways to fill that time, of course, is solo wargaming. Now, there are plenty of options for that, and we're going to talk about that today in the Little Wars TV Guide to Playing With Yourself. That uh, didn't sound right at all. I'm so lonesome, I could cry. Like I said, there's a number of different options out there, but this is a historical miniatures wargaming channel primarily, so let's focus on that first. The easiest option, of course, is just to set up a game on your tabletop at home and play as both sides. That's great if you have the terrain and miniatures at home to do that, which is actually a problem for me right now, but there are a couple things that you need to watch out for when you do that. Of course, the first of those is don't take sides. Uh, you know, don't show favoritism for one side or the other. Always play to the best of your ability, regardless of which side you're on. The second key is the rule set that you're going to use. I go, you go, rule sets are really the best for this and ones that don't have hidden information. Uh, for example, like an Altar of Freedom, Greg's Civil War rule set, because it relies on secret bidding before each turn begins by either side, that's really not ideal for the type of left hand versus right hand gaming that we're talking about here. Personally, I think rule sets along the lines of Warlord games, uh, Black Powder or Hail Caesar are really good in these situations because not only do they have an I go, you go system, but also after you give your orders, you have to roll for each unit to see if they actually follow those orders or to what extent they follow those orders. That adds a layer of friction that is going to present a lot of challenges for playing both sides of a particular engagement and force you into making changes on the fly. Of course, there are downsides to playing both sides in a game like this. Most importantly, you can't come up with long, intricate plans to surprise your opponent since you are your opponent. Uh, there's really no way to get rid of that completely, but there are ways to mitigate it. The first one is you can have your opponent largely controlled by an artificial intelligence or AI. Now, there aren't many rule sets that actually include a full AI, but if you watched our review of the Men Who Would Be Kings rule set from Osprey, which we used to play the Asad Luana game, uh, you know that in that rule set, there's Mr. Babbage. The author of the rule set has created a semi-AI that lists a bunch of priorities that in any given situation, the AI is going to act most likely in a particular way based on those priorities. It really works pretty well, and uh, you can actually adjust that and adapt it to a number of other genres and eras with just a little bit of tinkering. Just make sure that before you play the game, you set up those priorities, and during the game, you stick to them rigidly. Another family of rule sets that actually works very well solo is the two-hour war games rule sets, uh, like their World War II rule set, Nuts. The reason this works well is, first of all, they are designed to be either head-to-head -head or solo games, and they use a reaction system where when you're taking actions, the opponent is going to react to them in a number of different ways, both in movement and in combat, and you roll against that. So what it creates is a very free-flowing kind of combat experience where you can't predict exactly what the other side is going to do, and that's perfect in a situation where you're playing against yourself. Finally, I'll also say that you can create a compelling and challenging gaming scenario, even if you're just taking on yourself without an AI, with some creative scenario design before you start. For example, maybe you have to get a force of troops from one end of the table to the other, or have to capture and hold uh, multiple objectives. Well, each time you make it a certain distance across the board, or each time that you capture one of those objectives, have a prepared sheet off to the side that you roll against to see what random reinforcements show up for the enemy, and then maybe roll for exactly where they show up. Depending on how you roll, very quickly you can get yourself in very, very difficult situations and it can be very difficult to get out of them. Now, we've been talking about tabletop miniature wargaming, and that's primarily our focus here, but the fact is all of the members of the club also very much enjoy board wargames and video game wargames. And when you start getting into those areas, the opportunities actually seem pretty endless. 
Looking at board wargaming, it seems that these days designers are putting more and more focus on either making solo-only board games or including solo modes, either through scenarios or the use of AI bot systems, in their designs. In fact, every single one of the games that you see over my shoulder here is either designed for solo play or has a mode within the game that allows for solo play. For what it's worth, here are my three favorite games that I own and have played for solo wargaming. First, there's the Peloponnesian War, a classic design by Mark Herman. This game was recently re-released by GMT Games and is unlike anything else I've ever played. Sure, it looks like a typical point-to-point -point cardboard counter game, but it includes a robust AI that you play against. And best of all, it includes a unique mechanism where each turn there's a chance that you, the player, are forced to switch to commanding the other side. And the likelihood increases with the more success you're having. Next up is Thunderbolt Apache Leader from Danverse and Games. Now they offer a whole slew of solo-only games, and I have a number of them. So far my favorite, however, is this game. It feels kind of like a combination of a war game and RPG that has you take command of a close air support squadron as it fights in a number of possible campaigns. You'll choose what aircraft to use, how to arm them, and what pilots fly each mission, then play out those missions against AI-controlled forces. Really a fantastic game, and just one of many in Danvers and Games' leader series. Now finally, my favorite solo war game is Nemo's War by Victory Point Game. In Nemo's War, you take on the role of Captain Nemo from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and command the Nautilus as you explore the ocean depths, manage your crew, and wage a one-man war against the forces of imperialism. Now I have to admit, many will argue this is not a true war game as combat is very simplified and only a small part of the game. I don't care, however. It's got war in the name, and that's good enough for me. Now I know what some of you are probably thinking. I'm a miniature gamer. I don't want to push around cardboard pieces on a game board. I, I get it. Um, but these are desperate times, and desperate times call for desperate actions. You can do it. I believe in you. Second, Many board war games can actually be pretty easily recreated on the tabletop. Sometimes it's just as easy as taking the same rules and substituting inches or centimeters instead of hexes for movement and firing range, things like that. Another thing you can do is substitute your miniatures for the cardboard counters on the game board. That's what I did here with my Anglo-Zulu War Forces while playing Victoria Cross 2 from Worthington Publishing. In short, Board war games these days offer a tremendous opportunity for some challenging and exciting solo wargaming experiences. Now we'll turn to video games. Everyone here at Little Wars TV enjoys playing a good video game, and there are plenty of options out there for historical or historical-ish war games. Now if you watched our San Nazar episode, you saw me talking about how I've played World of Warships for years, and I have. That being said, I actually have spent a lot more time and am currently playing a lot more of its sister game, World of Tanks. Admittedly, it's a first-person shooter, uh, and that's not for everybody, but I do enjoy it quite a bit. If you're looking for a more miniatures feel to your game, there's a number of options out there. And probably the favorite amongst the club here is the Total War series of games from Creative Assembly. Every single one of the entries in that series has a great combination of a campaign mode where you're building your armies and dispatching them to various territories that then leads to tactical battles which honestly feel very, very much like commanding a tabletop war game. If you're an American Civil War fan, then I can recommend Ultimate General Civil War from Game Labs. There you can participate in single battles or linked battles in a sort of campaign where each battle actually plays out very much like a tabletop game with a very miniatures feel. Now if you're interested in more of a traditional hex encounter experience, then a great option would be Order of Battle World War II from Slytherin. Uh, in this one, yeah, it feels just like you're playing a Hex Encounter war game on your screen. The nice thing, though, is it takes care of all the modifiers for you. You don't have to take a look at a bunch of charts and roll up some dice. So it ends up being a very streamlined experience with a very old-school Hex Encounter war game feel. Now, finally, while the games are not historical in any way whatsoever, 
I can't recommend strongly enough one of my favorite video games of all time, which is the XCOM series of games from 2K Games and Firaxis. These things are, and, and other people have said this, but I also believe it myself, these, these games are the closest thing I've ever experienced in a video game to the tabletop experience, uh, particularly in skirmish war games. I mean, the mechanisms are all familiar for players of skirmish tabletop games where you've got action points and movement distances and, uh, you know, firing modifiers and uh, the percentage chance to hit, all of which is transparent and you can pay attention to if you want to in the game or you can just go with the flow. But they're a tremendous amount of fun. Hopefully this video has given you some ideas on how you can get your wargaming fix even if you can't get together with your friends in person or online. If you've got other ideas for how to make for a compelling solo game, or have some favorite solo games of your own that you want to recommend to everybody, please put them in the comments down below, because we're all in this together. So until next time, stay healthy.